You only get one cake, preacher. <laughs> there we go. We're up and running. Good, good, good. And welcome to all those who are home. I was just uh, starting to share that last week was uh, our 60th birthday, and, and I mentioned uh, jokingly about talking to one of the young uh, girls who uh, in ele elementary school about uh, wishing I had pink hair, but, you know, it just didn't work. Well, this Wednesday night, uh, somebody gave me something that uh, <laughs> took care of that, so uh, I don't know. How's that looking from all the others? Pretty good. Uh, the funny thing is, I had this on at the at the Wednesday night ap after the class was over, and there was only like four people in the room, and I, my wife and I and two other adults, and I was waiting to speak to one of the ladies, and my grandson Jacob came up behind me to my wife and says, where's Grandpa? She says, right here. He says, I saw him come in here. Where is he? She said, he's right there. And I turned around. He didn't even recognize me. So uh, that is an improvement. But I'm telling you what, it is hot to do that. So I'm used to air conditioning. That's the way we're going today. But uh, welcome. We're glad that you're here. And I uh, appreciate all the, the fun that everybody had at my expense last week. And uh, Really appreciate all the kindness as well. Exodus chapter 17 this morning as we continue our study of the life of Moses. And I began with a story I heard about a boxer who was in a really tough match. And he was, he was just getting beat up pretty badly. So he leaned over the ropes uh, toward his trainer at the end of one of the rounds and said, Throw in the towel. This guy is killing me. Well, the trainer, you know, not wanting to give up and wanting to be an encouragement to his fighter said, oh, no, he's not, he's not killing you. He's not even hitting you. He hasn't laid a glove on you. At that point, the boxer wiped blood from his eye and said, well, then I wish you'd watch that referee because somebody's killing me. <laughs> Whether you realize it or not, there, there are people that are always trying to hit and to destroy the people of God. We live in a day, literally, where religion is mocked and the idea that there is even a kingdom of darkness or this idea that there is a personal devil and his angels and demons that do his bidding is mocked. But those of us who believe that the word of God is inspired and inerrant must take seriously the fact that there is someone out there, whether you can see them or not, who's always trying to destroy the people of God. Deliverance, as was the case for Israel, deliverance from slavery does not mean there's no need for bravery. The people of God must anticipate conflict as they follow their leader home. And I believe the journey home is a constant call to arms. And I think that's going to be illustrated uh, in this great story from Exodus chapter 17. Join me there at home on the YouVersion Bible app or if you're here in person on the screen behind me. Exodus 17 beginning in verse 8. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were losing. When uh, the Am uh, Amalekites were winning, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears of it because I will completely blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. So Moses built an altar and called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, For, ha for hands were lifted up to the throne of the Lord. The Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. Now, We've got to remember in this story that we're following with the progression of the deliverance of Israel from Egypt that warfare 
going into battle was something that was completely new for the Israelites. For 400 years previously, they had been slaves in Egypt. They, they were never conscripted into Pharaoh's army. The last thing that Pharaoh and the Egyptians wanted to do was to arm the Israelites and teach them the skills of warfare. So this is something very new for them as they're out there in the desert and they began to be attacked by these guerrilla warriors called the Amalekites. In fact, if you go back to Exodus 13, you'll discover that when the people came out of Egypt after the Passover night, it says there in a very interesting verse that God did not lead them uh, along the shortest way to, their, to the promised land because there were military outposts along that way and he didn't want his people to face war at that point because they might get discouraged and they might be uh, determined to go back to Egypt. But understand nobody follows God's leading and gets a permanent pass from conflict. There may be a season or there may be a time in your life where God leads you on a path of peace or protection or puts a hedge around you so that you can grow and learn and, and become more mature and better equipped. But the fact of the matter remains that nobody goes from slavery all the way to the promised land without some battles along the way. Three times at least I can find in the New Testament where Paul specifically calls the Christian life a fight. He told young Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, fight the good fight of faith. Now there are a lot of metaphors for the Christian life in the scripture and that may not be your favorite one, but it is one. And you've got to understand something that's really important theologically here. And that is, there are some things that only God will do and can do. And then there are some things that you and I must participate with God in doing. Only God can redeem. Okay? You and I don't add anything to our redemption quotient. When the children of Israel, like they stood on the banks of the Red Sea and the Egyptian army is pursuing them from behind, Moses said to the nation, all you need to do is stand still. You just be quiet. You watch what God does. And all through the scripture, the deliverance from Egypt and the crossing of the Red Sea then becomes a metaphor for our redemption. And the point is, you and I don't add anything to our salvation. Salvation is God's work from start to finish. But it's interesting that not long after they cross the Red Sea, they encounter other armies and get into battles. And now God says, okay, now it's your turn. You have a role to play. See, redemption doesn't mean freedom from conflict. Amalek stands for all the host of hell that is opposed to the rule of God and opposed to the people of God. And there are going to be times in your life and mine when we're going to engage in conflict with the enemies of God. And here's what I believe. I believe we, the fighter fights his way home on his knees. Every believer fights his way home on his knees. The church has got to rediscover prayer as our chief weapon against the enemy's strategies and assaults. Yes. Let me show you a couple of verses that I think really emphasize that. Now, you've heard me make the first point, and I want to make another point that I hope will make the first point even more powerful. Over in Matthew's Gospel, in chapter 16, are some of the most famous verses in the Bible. Jesus says to Peter, who has just confessed him as the Son of God, Jesus says in response, Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades, or hell, will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Now you've heard me say before that Gates are a defensive weapon. The church that Jesus intended to begin and to plant following his resurrection was to be a militant 
church. It was to be an aggressive, growing, on the attack, proactive church. And the image is that the church would go out against hell's kingdom and hell's borders. And hell would raise up defensive gates to try to stop the advance of the church. And the church would knock down those gates and reclaim what Satan had illegitimately claimed for his own and bring it back under the banner of God. I think sometimes, though, we have got the image reversed. We think our job as the church is to huddle inside our buildings, get behind our walls, and just put up defensive positions all around so that we can hold on until Jesus comes back to rescue us. When in fact we should be the ones out there knocking down the gates of hell. And Jesus said that's the church I intend to plant. I intend to be the Lord of an aggressive, militant, attacking church. And I'm going to give you the keys, Jesus said, to the kingdom. So that you can bind and loose in this battle against the gates of hell. Now a couple chapters over in Matthew 18. There's an interesting collection of verses Jesus says in beginning in verse 18 of Matthew 18, I tell you the truth, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That sound familiar? We, we just read those exact words back in chapter 16 when Jesus was talking to Peter about knocking down the gates of hell. Now look at the very next word, again. Now many times we say again, what we mean is, listen, I'm about to repeat myself. I'm about to tell you what I just told you, but maybe I'm going to use different words now. I just told you that I'm going to give you the power to bind and loose. And again, I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything you ask for, it'll be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three come together in my name, there I am with them. Now, the question this morning is, what is the church's chief offensive strategy? What is to be our primary weapon, our chief means of taking on the gates of hell and knocking them down? According to Jesus, it is to be prayer. Through the act of corporate unified, agreed upon prayer in the name of Jesus, we are to aggressively diminish the influence and dominion of darkness in this world. Now the question for us is, do we really believe that? Do we really believe that prayer is our primary strategy for succeeding in our mission? I think a lot of us think prayer is what you do at the start and end of a worship service or at the start of a meeting where then you go on to talk about what strategy you're going to use Instead of prayer being the strategy. Most of us, uh, of us in this room today are old enough to remember the Lone Ranger uh, serial. Uh, in fact, I was flipping through the channels just yesterday and there was a Lone Ranger episode. I caught like the last three minutes of it. Uh, but I remember in one of those Lone Ranger episodes, there's this little man in a brown robe and he's got a bald head and he's got the rope that's tied around his waist. Very much looks like the epitome of meekness and weakness. And he comes out of this little old mission church. And then you hear the, the music and you see these two mighty horses with their nostrils flaring and their manes flying and uprides Tonto and the Lone Ranger. And you see this meek little preacher of a man go out and say something to the Lone Ranger. And the Lone Ranger says, no, Padre, it might be dangerous. And the little man says, but I want to help. And the Lone Ranger says, well, I guess you can pray. And he says, hi old silver away, you know, and Kimosabi and Tonto take off, and you know the bad guys are now in trouble. But who does the camera follow in that instant? It doesn't follow the guy who, who's going back into the mission church to pray, because that's not where the action is. The action is with the two guys on the big horses. 
And I think unconsciously, that's how the church has often felt about prayer. You know, it's nice when the ladies have their midweek prayer meeting. Let's let them do that. And let's be sure to start all of our Sunday school lessons with prayer and all of our elders meetings with prayer. And let's make sure we have prayer at the beginning of every service and maybe even one at the end. And then let's get about the business of doing what we're supposed to be doing. See, I think Moses understood and not just understood, but modeled what it really means to be a prayer warrior. Let's learn from his example today three things about what it means to be a prayer warrior. First of all, a prayer warrior insists that the real struggle is not against flesh and blood. The real struggle is not against flesh and blood. See, Moses didn't run for cover. He ran for help. He didn't go up to the mountaintop to escape the fighting. He wanted to be in the thick of it. And I believe Moses was discerning enough to recognize the power behind the problem. Probably one of the things that keeps the church so anemic is that we fail to recognize uh, the power of prayer against the forces of the enemy. And we spend so much of our energy fighting the symptoms and not the cause of evil in our world. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, and this is a passage you know well, Finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and the authorities and the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In other words, what Paul is suggesting is that visible victories come as a result of unseen spiritual battles. There is a, a realm that is there around us, a realm that even though it's unseen, it's a realm where there is a great cosmic battle between good and evil taking place. And Paul understood that if you don't address and acknowledge that the existence of that realm, then the visible realm where you spend all of your energy will be fruitless. Now, I don't know a lot about that invisible realm, but I read, for example, in Daniel chapter 10, where Daniel is praying to the Lord to deliver the people, and an angel shows up to Daniel. Do you remember the story? The angel says to Daniel, I would have been here sooner in response to your prayers. In fact, three weeks sooner. But the prince of Persia detained me. And Michael, the archangel, showed up to deal with him so I could get here to you. Now, either in that passage, Daniel is speaking allegorically, but he doesn't say that he is. Or there is something going on in the unseen world that has a direct bearing on the fruitfulness of our prayers. See, you and I cannot take on the enemy in our own strength. It is foolish to think that we can advance the kingdom of God by ourselves when we finally realize who and what it is we're up against. Let me just remind you, that some months later, after this passage we read of the battle against the Amalekites, some months later, the children of Israel are on the doorstep of the promised land. And Moses sends in spies on a reconnaissance mission. Twelve spies, ten of them come back and say, we can't take this land. Giants live there. The people rebelled and God is angry and God says, okay. Then for the next 40 years, you get to wander in the desert until the last one of this generation dies. Your kids will get to enter the promised land, but none of you will. And the people suddenly realize the folly of their mistake and rebellion. And they repent and say, oh, no, God, we're sorry. We're sorry. We'll go take the land now. 
And they go into the land armed for battle, but without God's blessing. You remember what happened? They got routed by the people who lived in the land. And if you go over and read Numbers chapter 14, the people who routed the people of God were called the Amalekites. The people that they could be here in Exodus 17 massacres them in Numbers chapter 14 because in Numbers chapter 14, the people went without God. That's why as Christians, we should never undertake more than we can cover with prayer. I don't think prayer is the preparation for the battle. It is the front lines of the battle. And I think it's ironic that our enemy is more aware of the power of prayer than the people of God seem to be. But let me just tell you something this morning. I think you already know it, but it's worth repeating and remembering. And that is that Satan is not afraid of your name. He's not afraid of my name, but he is afraid of Jesus's name. It's Jesus's name and and that every authority and dominion must recognize and bow to. And so every prayer warrior calls on that name, understanding that wars that are fought in the valley are often won or decided on the mountaintop. As with Moses, as he's praying over the nation in battle. Prayer warrior insists that the real struggle is not against flesh and blood. Secondly, a prayer warrior resists the temptation to pray only for himself. I think one of the great writers of the last century was C.S. Lewis. You ought to read some of his works if you never have. And I, I would really encourage you to read a little book he wrote called The Screwtape Letters in which he imagines a senior demon named Screwtape giving instructions to a junior demon named Wormwood. And the instructions that were given were how to tempt human beings. Listen to his advice. Wormwood, the junior demon, is told, I, the devil, will always see to it that there are always bad people. Your job, Wormwood, is to provide me with the people who do not care. And you see, that's how the gates of hell stay up. People that pray continually care about more than just their own well-being. I mean, let's be honest. How many times have you used that little phrase, I'll pray for you, as nothing more than an exit line? It's just a, a way to get out of a conversation, in the conversation, and, and go on to something else instead of being a real legitimate promise to intercede for somebody. I'll, I'll pray for you. See, I think these novice Israelite soldiers down there in the valley facing their first real uh, battle and conflict, literally fighting for their lives, do you think it was a source of inspiration for them to look up there on top of the hill and to see their leader with hands raised and face pointed toward heaven interceding on their behalf in, in, into the throne room of God? See, Satan loves to pick off the weak and the struggling. And that's why Moses would later say to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy 25, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey and cut off all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. That's what Satan does. He likes to find the weary, the worn out, the discouraged people, the people who are on the fringe, lagging behind, and start picking them off one by one. Who's looking out for those people? Who's covering those people with prayer? I honestly believe the prayer cover of other believers is the reason I'm still in the fight. I look back on my life, I look back on my ministry, I look back on the, some of the things I've had to deal with, both personally and professionally, and the only explanation I can give you for some of the things that I've handled and I've endured and still was able to stick it out is that I know people were praying for me. 
so powerful that even when I was weary and worn out, Satan wasn't able to pick me off. There was a young boy in Australia named Adam McGuire a few years ago who was surfing and he felt something knocking him off of his board and then felt a sudden pain in his side. He'd been attacked by a shark. 300 feet out from shore, has this big gash in it on his abdomen and there's no way he's gonna make it to shore. And just as suddenly as the shark showed up, so did a school of dolphins. And that school of dolphins began to attack that shark and literally press that shark out into deep water. And Adam was able to make it to the shore. The dolphins saved his life. And I think there have been many times in my life when that's exactly what's happened to me. The evil one has had his sights on me, wanted to hurt me, wanted to wound me. But prayers came to my defense in a mighty way and protected me. And I want to tell you something about our enemy. He doesn't have an anti-prayer defense. I mean, think about that. You can give somebody a Bible, but you can't make them read it. You can give somebody a sermon CD, but you can't make them listen to it. You can give them a video, but you can't make them watch it. You can hand them or speak to them and give them an invitation to come to church with you, but you can't make them come. But there's nothing that they can do if you drop a prayer bomb on their head. <laughs> you know, a prayer bomb is laser guided. Satan can't stop it. It lands always where it's supposed to land. And listen, the Bible reminds us that we as the church are a kingdom of priests. And one of the priests' chief duties is intercession. Look at Philippians 1.9 where Paul says, For I know that through your prayers... And the help given by the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me, will turn out for my deliverance. Notice it's going to be a combination of their prayers and the Spirit of God, Paul says, are going to deliver me. It says much the same thing in 2 Corinthians 1. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Prayer warrior may do a lot for somebody after he prays for them, but he'll do nothing until he prays for them. So a prayer warrior resists the temptation to pray only for himself. And then one other, a prayer warrior enlists others to join him in prayer warfare. It's not a coincidence that Moses took Aaron and her up with, up with him to the mountain. Let me tell you something. Intercessors need interceding too. Praying for tired believers can be tiring itself. If you need someone to affirm that that's the truth, just ask any one of our elders. Prayer for tired believers is exhausting. That's why prayer warriors tend to operate together. What did Jesus say? I give you authority to bind and loose for where two or three come together in my name. Now there is a time to go to alone to your prayer closet. Jesus talks about that in Matthew 6. There's a time for you to just get up by yourself and go into your closet and pray in secret. But there's also a time to get together with other believers in prayer for corporate prayer. And spiritual battle is one of those Times. Alexander the Great, they said, conquered the world using a battlefield technique called the Macedonian phalanx. When Alexander, what Alexander said was, don't ever go into battle by yourself. Back then, the soldiers would carry a shield and a sword. And, and uh, when you had your shield, but you wanted to thrust with your sword, you know, the shield had to come out of the way so you could thrust with your sword. And so you're, you exposed your body was, was vulnerable to a counterattack. And so Alexander said, you always make sure there's a man to your side with his shield protecting you as you uh, engage the enemy. Don't ever go into battle by yourself. And with that simple strategy of the Macedonian phalanx, he conquered the world. Aaron and Hur were there to help Moses 
stay connected to the power of God. Can't just one person, you say, can't just one person praying by himself make a difference? Of course, absolutely. God hears every prayer. But I think God especially enjoys a prayer symphony. And if you go back to that verse in Matthew 18, verse 19, where he says, when two or three come together and agree on anything and ask, it, ask for it in my name, that word agree is the Greek word from which we get our English word symphony. God says, when you come together and you symphonize in prayer, you unite and you agree on something in my name, I'm going to listen. I'm going to respond. So I want to ask you today, do you have an Aaron and a her in your life? When we raise our arms to God, we need to also be holding on to the arms of fellow soldiers as well. There's one thing about the banner of God. It's big enough for us to march side by side under. Let me tell you something about the Lord who is our banner our banner highlights our belief that the battle belongs to the Lord. That's why we believe so strongly in prayer. Moses would later say in Deuteronomy chapter 20, For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you to fight for you against your enemies to give you victory. The battle really does belong to God, and that's why our chief weapon will always be prayer. Heard a story about a bunch of recruits. They were having a written exam at boot camp. And a sergeant came up to one of them and said, Son, why aren't you working on your test? And he said, Well, sir, I, I don't have a paper or, or a piece of paper or a pencil. What? The sergeant said, Tell me, boy, what would you think of a soldier who went into battle and he didn't have his rifle or his ammunition? And the recruit thought for a moment and said, Well, I think he was an officer, sir. <laughs> Too many Christians act like officers in the army of God who don't have any need for weapons. Listen, the truth is we're all on the front lines. The gates of hell are there for us to attack, and we advance against those gates on our knees. So consider this lesson a call to arms. I love what Corey Ten Boom once said. She said, prayer is powerful. The devil smiles when we make plans. He laughs when we get busy, but he trembles when we pray, especially when we pray together. So let's do that as we close this morning. Would you bow with me? Father, I pray that you would remind us and cause us to reflect again on the, the power, the resource that is made available to us by Jesus. Lord, when he was crucified on that cross and gave up his spirit, the temple veil was torn into from top to bottom, signifying that now the, the way was open for us to enter into the very presence of God. And we must confess, Lord, there are times when we've either ignored that access altogether or we've minimized it and written it off as something less powerful than it really is. But, Father, we have the opportunity to enter into your very throne room, to lay our petitions and our requests before your throne of grace and find mercy to help in our time of need. But more than that, Father, we have the opportunity to draw upon all of your resources, to have you engage in battle with us as we advance against the gates of hell in our society and culture today so that we can reclaim what Satan has illegitimately claimed for his own and bring it back under the reign of the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you for this powerful, incredible resource that is ours through prayer. May we make use of it alone and together in this week to come is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining in with us online, and uh, we look forward to seeing you next week, hopefully in person for those of you who are here in our area. God bless you, and thank you for watching.